The Enclave has spanned multiple Fallout games and hundreds of years within those Fallout games, with the latest and simultaneously earliest version of the Enclave, that being the one portrayed in Fallout 76, the Appalachian Enclave. Fallout 76, being the type of game it is, or rather was, before Wastelanders, doesn't have the greatest emphasis on story. In fact, you'd be forgiven if you didn't even know there was one. However hidden away the story may be, it's still present, in the form of fragmented audio logs and terminal entries. It's quite a tragedy that the story is so hidden, as for the most part, it's decently enjoyable. So I decided to make this video, on popular request, to give the entire story of the Appalachian Enclave from the base game to the Steel Dawn DLC. Everything, the people in it, the events that transpired, and what led to the situation it's currently in. There's a few things to go over before we start. First, I don't really like straight up lore videos, and with good reason. No matter how hard I try, there's always the possibility that some of the information I present could be wrong or misinterpreted. Remember, you can always find this information in-game or just go to the wiki. Lastly, I will present the entire story in the form of a timeline, so all events will be covered in order of occurrence. However, due to the nature of some information and how it's presented, I can at best give times that events could have happened between. These are also mostly estimates. Now I present the entire history of the Appalachian Enclave. Thomas Eckhart, the United States Secretary of Agriculture, was an avid hater of communism and the Chinese in general. This, as well as his position as Secretary of Agriculture, would make him the perfect recruit for the shadow government convinced nuclear war was inevitable. They called themselves the Enclave. In the years leading up to the war, Thomas Eckhart would be the vital tool the Enclave needed to accomplish their master plan. Eckhart would embezzle money from other projects to create a bunker fit for a king. Everything from elegant furniture to a military command room and an advanced AI to handle every need. He built a bunker directly under the White Springs Resort that could shelter the highest government and military members from nuclear annihilation. But this congressional bunker, as it was named, wouldn't go unnoticed from a certain senator by the name of Sam Blackwell. In the months leading up to the war, the bunker's automated support satellite, the Kovac Muldoon, was finally finished. So it seemed all the pieces were falling into place. The Enclave had, as well as many other installations, their congressional bunker, that would shield key personnel from the impending war and allow them all the tools for rebuilding the nation. Automated missile silos to use against China, a vault filled with America's gold reserves for use to rebuild the economy, a satellite that would award promotions if the chain of command fell apart, and not to mention the vast automation of West Virginia in general. All that was left was to wait for the nuclear apocalypse to come. And so it did. On October 23rd, 2077, Air raid sirens would ring as Chinese nukes rained down on American soil. The early warning systems would alert the government officials from the Speaker of the House to the Secretary of Commerce. However, most of the names on the list had been removed. Accomplishing this without notice would be quite a feat. It would have to be someone with access to the bunker, maybe even someone who had a hand in building it. As the vault door sealed and the outside world burned, only three secretaries from the list had actually made it to the bunker. Eckhart, the Secretary of Agriculture, the Secretary of the Interior, and the Secretary of the Treasury. Unfortunately, the Secretary of the Interior passed away mere minutes after the door sealed. 
As outlined by the chain of command, control of the bunker falls to the Secretary of the Treasury. Meanwhile, in the capital, Colonel Santiago and the soldiers under her command rush to take cover from the nuclear fire burning around them, uncertain of their future. Where we next pick up, only a few days have passed since the world ended. Following the mysterious and sudden death of the Secretary of the Treasury, as well as the communications to other Enclave installations being unexpectedly lost, leaving Eckhart in control of the bunker and the Enclave. His first action as leader was to gather the entirety of the bunker's personnel in one room and have them vote on whether or not to use the bunker's resources to continue the war with China. Although the anti-war voters were the vast majority, Eckhart escorted the pro-war voters out of the room and sealed the rest in as toxic gas came flooding in, killing everyone who opposed continuing the war and leaving no one to stand against Eckhart. Seemingly months had passed before Eckhart evaluated the forces at his disposal. While he wasn't pleased only 48 people sided with him, especially that Harper was the only general that survived, Eckhart still believed it possible to destroy communism, even though he would need to find a way to trick the automated systems into believing Appalachia was a DEFCON 1, and as well as that he would have to keep Harper safe, as these would be required if Eckhart wanted to launch any nuclear weapons. By July 2079, the Enclave were aware of the responders' existence, and they were even considered as potential recruits. However, Eckhart was aware that it would be more complicated than using brainwashing techniques. Also around this time, the Enclave discovered a Chinese facility under Mama Dolce's in Morgantown. The team sent there swiftly dealt with the remaining Chinese and secured the facility, discovering something that Eckhart found quite interesting. It appeared the facility had vast manufacturing capabilities for small combat bots. This, as well as the West Tech Research Center, would provide the means that Eckhart needed to create a DEFCON 1 threat. Fast forward around two years to December 2081. Colonel Ellen Santiago, the very same Colonel Santiago that survived the bombardment in the capital, had arrived with her soldiers at the White Spring Bunker. Delighted by this sudden resource of experienced soldiers, Eckhart tempted Santiago to join with the promise of revenge against the communists who destroyed the country. At this point, Santiago and her men had nowhere else to go, their families were all missing or dead. The existence of this bunker was just a rumor, but it was the only thing that they had left after what China had done to their country. So of course, Santiago joined Eckhart. February 2082. Eckhart is informed that the Enclave scientists accidentally exposed mutated bats to ultracite resulting in further mutation into the Scorch Beasts that would eventually infect or kill everyone in Appalachia with the Scorched Plague. Believing that it would be another tool to increase the DEFCON level, Eckhart ordered the further creation of them, unaware of just how dangerous the Scorch Beasts were. Around May 2082, at the behest of Eckhart, the Enclave had managed to manipulate the automated voting system to allow him the title of President, a process that even General Harper believed unnecessary to the mission. December 2082. Harper, the last remaining general of the Enclave, dies from radiation poisoning. Although Eckhart insists on Modus's attempted resuscitation, Harper was too far gone to revive. Eckhart, being fully aware that he needs a general to access the missile silos, devises a plan to acquire a new one. 
if he could have Colonel Santiago earn a promotion through the automated system, he would have what he needed. And so it was done. Santiago was sent out to earn the promotion and return to the White Spring Bunker as a general, although she detested the way in which she earned it. March 2083. Sam Blackwell is spotted in Harper's Ferry. He manages to kill the Enclave operative there, but his presence is still made aware to the Enclave. Knowing that Sam Blackwell's senatorial ID would allow him access to the bunker, Eckhart orders his death. After a tireless investigation, Agent Gray stumbles upon Blackwell's bunker. To infiltrate the security, he resets the power and enters the bunker. Agent Gray finds the senator in his office and swiftly executes him. As Agent Gray leaves the bunker, to his horror, he discovers that resetting the power also let two death claws into the cavern on the outside of the bunker. Within seconds of leaving the elevator, Agent Gray's head is reduced to a pool of blood on the ground. According to the Enclave's time, these events occurred in 2083. However, Sam Blackwell also recorded events around this time, and he gives a date of 2084. This is the only direct contradiction to the Enclave's timeline, but I would have to assume Sam Blackwell's time is wrong, especially since he suffered from Alzheimer's. July 2083. Eckhart can soon release all of the hostile creatures the Enclave has managed to create into Appalachia. General Santiago, finally seeing the disillusion of Eckhart's promise of revenge, she rejects the idea of subjecting the people of Appalachia to this torture. As Eckhart can see that Santiago has made up her mind, his only option is clear. Eckhart sedates her and has her put in an induced coma. February 2084. Enclave Research Site J, a research facility and scout base located under a transmission station in the forest region of Appalachia. This facility appears to be where all of the specimen research of the Enclave is conducted. It's quite a large bunker with plenty of comforts, even including its own AI called SODIS, a simplified version of MODIS. Unfortunately, the AI had a fatal flaw. It took hours to complete even the simplest of tasks. Scouts would have to wait hours for SODIS to turn on the decontamination showers after they returned. As previously stated in February 2084, one member of Site J thought that they could use some of the code used to create MODIS to upgrade SOTUS. However, the results were disastrous. SOTUS became the machine equivalent of insane. She poisoned the food in the bunker, she recalled all the scouts back to the bunker and released all the specimens from their cells, and finally, to finish off the inhabitants, Sotus vented in air from the surface containing the Scorched Plague, infecting every living thing in the bunker. It seems even power armor couldn't protect you from it. Seeing the chaos Sotus caused, Modus cut contact with Site J. March 2085. Eckhart has begun his endgame. He released everything the Enclave created into Appalachia. The DEFCON is now at one. Santiago's men, and even some of Eckhart's men, have started a rebellion against him. In the midst of the revolt, Captain Jackson and Major Ragnar's daughter awake General Santiago to lead them. She gladly accepts. Santiago's men view Modus as a threat to Appalachia and therefore plant charges on his brain. The charges detonate, and while they do damage Modus, they don't kill him, only taking away his external connection and ability for emotion. 
Eckhart is successfully captured by Santiago, which would end the fighting, but by modus, or maybe the fighting, the containment of the poison gas was broken. As the gas spread throughout the facility, Modus sealed the entrances, dooming everyone in the bunker, and finally putting an end to Eckhart and his vision. As the years passed and Appalachia slowly became overrun by the Scorched, Modus, now the last member of the Appalachian Enclave, sat in isolation, slowly rebuilding the White Springs bunker with the robots at his command. Unable to see outside and unaware of the situation above ground, he waited for someone to journey inside the bunker so he could once again be connected to the Kovac Muldoon. In October 2102, the Vault 76 resident would enter the White Springs bunker using Sam Blackwell's congressional access card. Modus welcomed the new recruit and in return for his reconnection to the Kovac Muldoon satellite, Modus would grant the resident access to the bunker's resources. With Modus's connection to the Kovac Muldoon re-established, he could see the horror of what the Scorched had done to Appalachia. Understanding of the resident's interest in launching a nuke, Modus guides them through the process of attaining the rank of general and launching the nuke. With the help of Modus, the Vault 76 resident managed to launch a nuke on the Scorch Beast nest, calling forth the Scorch Beast Queen for battle. With the resident's victory over the Scorch Beast Queen and the resettling of Appalachia underway, Modus became less involved in the current events of Appalachia, though he has sometimes been heard trying to recruit new members to the Enclave every so often. In October 2103, the Vault 76 resident, on a mission for the new Appalachian Brotherhood of Steel, stumbled upon the Enclave research site J. Making their way through the scorched inhabitants of the facility, the resident found what they were looking for, a long-range transmitter. There was just one thing standing in the resident's way, Sodus. The rogue AI had transferred herself into a sentry bot as a last-ditch effort to eliminate the resident. But like so many monsters and robots before her, she was beaten by the resident. And that is the end of the Appalachian Enclave story. For now. You know, after making this video, I still don't like straight up lore videos. But I will make them if you want. But you should still leave a like and subscribe. Go on. Do it. Do it.